We are in numbers seven through nine. So just as a quick review, uh, last week we talked about, or, or we've talked about through this series, the phrase, as the Lord commanded, doing things as the Lord commanded. We talked about the fact that God is faithful. God is faithful, and we should do things because, uh, because he's faithful. Uh, he is faithful to them. He was faithful. He is faithful to us. We also talked about the fact that different people had different jobs. And last week, we looked at uh, the different uh, jobs that uh, some of the different people had. Uh, in relationship to the tabernacle, what they what they did with the tabernacle. We talked in, about the Nazarite vows and the Arianic blessing. And this week we're going to start with chapter 7. Now this chapter, chapter 7, is uh, not the longest chapter in the Bible because it's far exceeding length by Psalms 119. However, it is the longest in the Pentateuch, the five books, having 89 verses. I have mentioned to some to y'all before class, it takes about about eight minutes and 45 seconds just uh, for my CD to read through that. Uh, the master theme of the chapter is that it's the gifts of the princes of Israel for the dedication of the holy altar. Uh, it sets a precedent and demonstrates that the worship was for every tribe and supported by every tribe, and we'll see that. One commentator I read said it was the most redundant repetition, uh, but there's a reason behind that. I should mention that if you look through Numbers 1 through 6, and actually if you go back into Exodus, because we remember how Numbers starts, and how does Numbers start? Somebody read how Numbers starts. What does it say? Paul made a big deal about this when we started it. And the Lord spoke. What is and? Continuation. Okay, there we go. So if we go back to if we go back to Exodus, from Exodus about 40 all the way up here, it's kind of chronological. When we get to this point, uh, seven through nine, we kind of stop and we kind of we're going to kind of backtrack. And and if you've ever if you've ever made a a cake or a pie when you fold something into it, you put something. Is that right? No, did I get it right there? Right. Okay. When you fold it into it. 7 through 9 is kind of folded into the rest of Numbers previous to this, a little bit of Exodus previous to this. So we're kind of going to, Numbers kind of goes back. So if you, you kind of look at this and you're like, well, that's a little bit out of order. Well, it is. All right. So uh, going off the questions that Preacher Paul gave us, what is the significance of giving the Levites, giving to the Levites according to their service? Okay, how uh, did the Levites own land? When they get to the promised land, did the Levites own land? No. Uh, in fact, the, the Levites didn't really get an inheritance, did they? So how did the Levites function? How did they survive? From the offerings of their tribe. Uh, we think about 1 Timothy 5.18 says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while, it's, while it is threshing. And that's that's uh, that's part of part of this. Later on, we know when we get over to the uh, the prophets, they're going to have a a real problem because uh, these priests. Because if the temple's not being taken care of and the priests aren't being taken care of, what else isn't being taken care of? If you're not taking care of the temple, what what are you not taking care of? You're not taking care of God. All right. So if you're not taking care of the temple. You're not taking care of God. What are you not taking care of? You're not taking care of the priest. All right? All right? Uh, I, I know I've heard of congregations, as horrible as it may seem, that they didn't, that they wanted to get rid of their preacher, and so they quit giving money, you know? Uh, and they, they starved trying to, you know, like, really, people? That's really... He, he, he's still functioning. Do you know the, do you know we part of our giving, part of our giving goes to pay the preacher's salary. You know that's just the that's just the reality of it. You know we we pay him to to perform a service. Uh, 
and and they are and the labor is worthy of his hire. Okay, that's a concept from from the Levites here. All right, why did Moses not give carts to the sons of Kohath for their work? They were supposed to carry it. Okay, matter of fact, verse nine of chapter seven says, but he did not give any sons any to the sons of Kohath because theirs was the service of the holy objects which they carried how? On their shoulder, all right? What happens if they didn't carry it on their shoulder? Buzz it dies. Buzz it dies, okay, yeah. And, and I've told you before, I always thought that was the most, when I was a kid, I thought that was the horriblest story in the whole world because poor little Uzzah just trying to help out. I'm just, you know, just, you know. My son always said, I'm oh, just trying to help. My answer to him was, sometimes when you're helpful, you ain't helpful. You know? It almost been better if the, well, for us, it sure would have been better if the art would have fell. Um, yeah, they, this is it right here. Because they were supposed to carry it on their shoulders. All right. Summarize the offerings of the leaders of the Israel's tribes. Verse, chapter 7, verse 84 through 88. And you don't have to do that. I, I did that for y'all. So here we go. So 12 silver platters, about 130 shekels each, filled with flour. 12 silver bowls, 70 shekels each. 12 gold spoon, 10 shekels each, full of incense. 12 bulls, 24 oxen, 72 rams, 72 goats, 72 he lambs. A total of 252 anvils, about 2,400 shekels of silver, 120 shekels of gold, um, and, and I, I put that parable of talents. So what was the point, what was the point of him, uh, of, of the Holy Spirit putting that in there where they go through each tribe coming up there and giving one silver plate, one silver bowl, one spoon, one bull, two oxen, all, you know, all that stuff. What's the point of all that? Okay, show how important it was. All right. Okay. Now, how does it show how important it was? It was repeated 12 times. So everybody, all the tribes participated, right? Did, did all the tribes give the same thing? So yeah, all the tribes gave the same thing. So one tribe didn't give, didn't give more you know, oh, I'll give you 14, you know, things of gold. I'll give you two platters, you know, that sort of stuff. They all get the same thing. So all of them had a, had a, um, had a, all of them had a part in the work to, together, okay? All of them had participation in this. I talked about the, I, I put on here the parable of the talents you know, the, in, the, the concept of individual versus collective, okay? Uh, when we talk about the, the talents, some people got different talents, right? Uh, some people got different talents, okay? Kind of the individual versus the collective. In this particular case, all the tribes participated, all the tribes, uh, everybody was on equal footing as, as far as uh, what they initially gave to the, to the uh, leaders. Yes, sir. Yes. Because they were told what to give, and every one of them wanted to make sure they gave what they were supposed to. Yes. Uh, we saw the same thing with Nadab and Abihu, who were, uh, were zapped. God told, told the remaining uh, what he wanted to do, and it showed step by step by step, not one mirror from, it, from the further to him after that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I put it up uh, front, Lord. It, it's, it set a precedent and demonstrated that the worship was for every tribe and supported by every tribe, okay? So it was for every tribe and supported by every tribe, okay? All right, where did God speak to Moses? What's that? Say it again. Mercy seat. Mercy seat, on the mercy seat. 
Where's the mercy seat? All right, okay. Now, verse 89, when Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice speaking to him from the above the atoning cover that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim, so he spoke to him. All right. Yeah. From the mercy seat. All right, good. Chapter 8. So chapter 8 devotes a, a short paragraph, uh, verses 1 through 4, to the lighting of this candlestick. And then the balance of the chapter, 5 through 26, regards the cleansing or purifying of the Levites for their service to the tabernacle. The information here, again, is supplementary to, the, to that given in the previous chapters of the, the Pentateuch. Much of the Pentateuch appears somewhat in a form of a mosaic diary, but without any strict attention to the chronolog chronological fixation regarding the subjects treated. And this is what I was talking about earlier, about the fact that, you know, it's, if you look at this, it's not necessarily chronological in this particular section, but it goes back and kind of explains other things. And kind of, so if you're, if you're trying to put this in a, a flow chart, you'd have, to, you'd have to put an arrow back to, to a, a different chapter. All right. So how did Moses make the lamps according to chapter 8, verses 1 through 4? Okay. All right. So, uh, speak to Aaron and say, when you mount the lamps, the seven lamps will give you lamp, the light in front of the lampstand. Aaron therefore did so. He mounted the lamps at the front of the lampstand, just as the Lord came in also. Verse 4. Now this was the workmanship of the lampstand, hammered work of gold from its base to its flower ornamentation. It was hammered work according to the pattern which the Lord had shown Moses, so he made the lampstand. Now remember, when we, if we look back in Exodus, we know that God gave uh, knowledge and workmanship to certain people so that they would know how to do these particular skills, correct? You remember that? Okay. So um, he, this is kind of an explanation of, of some of that, the hammered work of gold with its flower ornamentation was, and it was hammered work, all right? And there were certain, if we look back in Exodus, there were certain rules concerning how that was to be done, all right? Uh, the pattern which the Lord shown. Uh, very important there. Take a look again at, uh, at according to the pattern. According to the pattern. Um, one of the things when I was talking in my, uh, uh, my class, uh, one particular class, was the, the idea that God has always had a pattern. God has always had a pattern. He has a pattern today. He had a pattern then. We need to follow the pattern now. Uh, we, they, they need to follow it then. We need to follow it now. Okay. How did Moses clean the, cleanse the Levites? Okay. They were sprinkled with water. They had to shave their head. They had to say it again, wash what? Wash their clothes. Okay. They had sprinkled with water, uh, verses 8 and 7. Shave all the flesh. They washed their garments. Had to make atonement had to be made for them. By, identi by identifying them with all of Israel who rep were represented by them, they were being... Uh, they did, had a wave offering before Jehovah, and then by the uh, subordination of the Levites to the priest, and by the commemorating of the event given unto Jehovah instead of the firstborn. All okay, right, now, um, compare this with the New Testament teaching on baptism. So how does this relate to baptism? Okay. Okay. Baptism cleanses us. All right. Cleanses us from our sins. 
How does baptism cleanse us from our sins? Okay, we, all right, by, A, by following this pattern, B, by when, when we go down the water, we make contact with Jesus' blood, we rise up in newness of life, right, okay, all right, we are cleansed at that point, right, okay, um, is it fair to say, is this a, is this a, a good analogy between the Levites cleansing and baptism? Is that like a, a good analogy or what would be, what would, might be a better analogy to compare this to? I don't know. That's a great question. I, the, the question is, where well, maybe they, uh, maybe they, I, I think the, the shaving of the hair had more to do with just the cleanse, uh, the cleansing ritual. Uh, it's a, just a ritual, ritualistic uh, cleansing. And, yeah. No, they don't, though. They, yeah, they, I, I, I it is not a comparison at all. I know bodybuilders when they uh, <laughs> bodybuilders when you know bodybuilders that show uh, um, they, they they shave their entire body all over. Yeah, it's yeah, and but it's the idea of you have nothing on you. You know everything's off. All the everything's over. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, that's not necessarily <laughs> that, right because you're a mom and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's right. All right. No, I get it. No, yeah. If you've ever had a kid that's had lice, yeah, you you Yeah, going through the girl's hair and you'll come here and just Yeah, you, yeah, you want to get rid of everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's that idea of uh, but it does give a sense of, it does give a sense of, it, that, that shaving of the whole body does give a sense of getting all the, the impediments of this world off. And if, if we're giving our life to Christ, we, in a sense, we, we have to get rid of all those impediments off our bodies too, off of all those things that, that keep us and drag us down. Yes, sir. Okay. Theirs was more physical than spiritual. Baptism is definitely a spiritual. Definitely. Baptism is definitely a spiritual. Very good. All right. Nope. Move forward. Ah, oh, there we go. What did Israel do? I thought I put the two back in there. To the Levites to put them in ser into service. What did Israel do to the Levites to put them into service? Spiritually cleansed, okay. Yeah, they had to lay their hands uh, uh, as a substitute for the, the first one. Uh, if, if Levites, if we were to compare it to um, New Testament, who do the Levites represent for us today? Who would be our Levites today? Well, yeah, ministers. Preachers, yeah, okay. All right. Um, so, We don't do it necessarily the, the way, we don't do it sort of this way. But I, but I know some congregations, when the, when the preacher, when, when a new preacher comes there, the elders will come before them and, and put their hand on them and say a prayer over them. Okay? Now, is that, is that 
wrong. Why would it be wrong? Well, let's ask. Is Right. Right. Is there, is there a, a let's, let's do it better. Is there a biblical example that we can give so that we, so we, we, uh, of that sort of thing? How did, how did, how did Paul, how, how did Paul appoint people? Okay, all right. So, and of course, I'm just th I'm, I'm thinking on the fly, which I shouldn't do. I should not do. Um, all right. What's that? They sent them out on the journey. Didn't they do that? Lay their hands on them and pray before. Yeah. the 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 idea of laying on hands. You, what What do we usually think of laying on hands as far as as that concept of laying hands on, what, what do we usually associate that with? Miracles. What's that? Miracles. It, miracles, imparting spiritual gifts. Usually, when we talk about laying on hands, we're usually talking about in the concept of, of imparting spiritual gifts. So Paul imparted spiritual gifts. They did uh, appoint elders in each place, and of course that was that was... Uh, mirac uh, miraculous in a way. All right. Um, but that just kind of, it's just a close pointing together. I mean, like, I guess it's more personal. Right. In this particular case, the representatives from their tribe uh, brought them out to show that they had the blessing, if you will, from their tribe, okay? And in the same way, if our elders, it, why when somebody comes forward, do, do we have somebody pray for you? And why does somebody come up and put their arm around you? Yeah, yeah, well, well, we're unique in that. I'm glad we do that. Yeah, yeah. Why, why when somebody comes forward, does somebody else come up there and sit beside them or put their arm around them? Okay, it's showing in, in a way that, that I, I'm with you. You're not alone in this. I, I'm, 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 I'm adding my blessing to this. Okay, and so uh, very much in, in this similar way that they were, they were showing the tribes, saying, saying, we, this is our person. This is who we move forward. If, if the elders gathered around Paul, let's say Paul was brand new, and, and the elders gathered around Paul and prayed over him, you know, that they would be showing, look, we as elders, you know, um, you know, are, are, are putting our blessing toward this. When we installed a new elder, uh, when uh, Todd, uh, Brother Todd came, became an elder, the, we all gathered and, the, you know, they gathered together and we prayed over him, you know. Uh, once again, just showing that that level of, of uh, representation. All right. Did I confuse you enough? Moving on. All right. What was the sin offering and burn offering for 8 12? For chapter 8, verse 12. It's an atonement for the Levites. Question he asked is there, Does this mean there was actual forgiveness of sin under the law of Moses? Yeah, no, you know, yeah, I'm glad we don't have to do some of the things Levites did too, so, yeah. Yes, Brother Floyd? <laughs> I'd appreciate it if you don't. <laughs> yes, it did, but they didn't realize it. Right. And that's the answer. The answer is yes, they did, but they didn't realize it. Um, it satisfied God. Right, it satisfied God. Uh, it's 
does that mean there was the actual forgiveness of sins? Yes. Sort of. <laughs> What's that? Right. God saw. It, and it's so, and what Brother Floyd's alluding to is the fact that God is without time. So he, he saw Jesus on the cross. So was there, was there forgiveness of sins? Yeah, there was forgiveness of sins. Okay. But they didn't know that. They kind of thought that. That was. David knew it more than anybody. Yeah, David did. Yeah, David knew it more than anybody. But, but again, that was. That was kind of one of those mysteries that God kept veiled. Right. That was one of those mysteries that God kept veiled, that they, that they didn't, they, they weren't fully aware of. Uh, all right. No, we're moving forward. <laughs> yeah, they still they were still were required to do the things God said. The problem was, as as we're told later on, is that nobody could completely fulfill the law, and that was the problem with the law. Right, right. Those sacrifices have been continued, but that atonement, because because that atonement, because th these priests had to stand before God, right? And you can't stand before God unless what? You're holy, right? You can't stand before God unless you're holy. All right. Well, how do you get to be holy? How do we get to be holy? Through the blood of Christ. I like the example that uh, my wife uses most of the time on uh, as a credit card. If I give you my credit card and you go down to Macy's or wherever and buy a suit, can you walk out there and put that suit in my credit card? Somebody owes you that money. Right. Right. So I, I'm saying that I'll pay that debt where that comes due. But are you real liable for it? No. No. <laughs> no. What about this? As Jesus said that I'm going to pay the price on the cross. Right. Later on, for your sins that you were committing before the cross and after the cross. So that credit card would came due. On that cross. Yep. Who paid for it? Jesus. Jesus paid for it. It's his credit card, not ours. That's good. That's a good point. All right. I like the credit card. I'm going to remember that. I'm going to steal that. So. It's a good one. Oh, it is a good one. All right. Well, I'm not going to steal it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to borrow it. I'm gonna... Not my original idea. Okay, here we go. What is the significance of chapter 8, verse 20? And 22. Thus did Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the son of Israel to the Levites according to all the, the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites. So the sons of Israel did to them. Verse 22. Then after that, the Levites went in to perform their service in the tent of meeting before Aaron and before his sons, just as the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites. So they did to them. What's the what's the point? They did what God said to do. To show strict compliance with the edicts of the Lord. All right? Everyone was compliant. It, it is it is so one of the things that is frustrating to me is is the, if you read through the Old Testament, one of the things that comes abundantly clear as you read at, as you read through the first five books, later on too, but especially the first five books, is God had a certain way He wanted things to be done. 
there was just, there was one way, one way. Do it this way, that's the way it'd be done. And it was, and, and, and it's pretty simple. It really is pretty simple. No equivocation, no, maybe I misheard you, misunderstood, any of that stuff, nothing. And then we get over the New Testament, and then God gives us a little bit of mercy, a little bit of grace, and we just act like we go crazy with it, like we don't know who God is. Because God gives us a little bit of grace, he doesn't tell us exactly everything down to the exact wire. He gives, he gives us enough parameters, and then we just go nuts with it. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's so frustrating to me because, because you're really trying to take advantage of God. And that's never in a good spot when you do that. Everyone was in compliance. Everyone knew. Everyone was there. And there's severe consequences for not. And that's the thing about it. God will, God, God, now, God will let us do whatever we want to do. There, you know, you, you're an adult. You, go, you, know, you can do whatever you want to do. But there's going to be consequences, you know. Unlike Uzzah, there was a few more Uzzahs around today. You know, maybe there wouldn't be. Anyway. If we do not contribute anything to our salvation, what is the significance of 821? Verse 21, the Levites too purified themselves from sin and washed their clothes, and Aaron presented them as a wave offering before the Lord. Aaron also made atonement for them to cleanse them. So what's the, what's the significance of that? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. That's what they did was do what God said. Okay. What's the what's the the general as as Paul uses the uh, the yellow page churches uh, general take on on uh, on what has to be done for salvation. Just believe. Just believe. All right? Um, what, what, what do we contribute to our salvation? Obedience. What's that? Obedience. Obedience, okay. All right? What else? Do we contribute anything else? Okay, faith. We have to add a faith in there. All right. Um, and after we're saved, what is our responsibility? What's that? Okay, remain faithful. Okay, quit talking like old Christians. If you're a brand new babe in Christ. <laughs> Think back all those many, many years ago, all right, when you were a brand new babe in Christ, what was your responsibility once you come up out of the water? What were you supposed to do at that point? Okay, I, I need to read more to know what God wants, okay? I, I, need, I, need, I need to understand more about God. Oh, oh, that's right, I gotta, I gotta change my life. My life has to be different now. I, I, I can't just I, I can't I can't just keep doing the same stuff I was doing, right? I, I gotta I, I have to I have to change, all right? I have to change. Um, they purify their from sins themselves from sin and wash their clothes. Okay. You ever had a kid? Wash, you, 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 know, you know, how many times this ever happened? You, kid gets out and, you, I mean, he's clean clothes and five seconds out, he's outside and smashing around the, the you, know, you know, well, you're just going to go to church dirty, you know, so. You just wash the clothes. I hate it. I can't stand it. I have, I have shirts. I have, you know, these nice little dress shirts and, and I'll get something on my, 
I just, I, you know, I get something on my, ah, it just drives me nuts, you know. Brother Phil Turner, you know, said, you know, wear a big, big tie so I don't drop spaghetti sauce on me. But anyway, all right. So what's that? Yeah. So I, I got I to gotta make a change to my life. I have to change, okay? I have to, have to, uh, have to, uh, have to make a change. All right. At what age would the Levites retire? <clears throat> How old? 50, okay? There's a verse in here, by the way, that talks about uh, uh, them, uh, verse 24. Go down to verse 24. This is what applies to the Levites from 25 years old and upward. They shall enter to perform the service and the work of the tent of meeting. What's the, what's the kind of the problem with that verse? What did we look at last week? How old did it say they were supposed to be? Yeah. Yeah. 30, actually. So, okay, so it's uh, 20 for the warriors, 30, 30 for the Levites, 25. Uh, most people seem to think that there was, there was some sort of a, uh, like a five-year apprentice program sort of, uh, sort of thing. Uh, because if you look at all the, the things that the priest had to do, there was a lot of stuff that the priest had to do. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a lot of things, okay? They were, in a lot, in, you know, I, I talked about it doing a Lord's Supper one time. If you think about it, um, the priests were in some way butchers, you know. Uh, uh, they were uh, meat carvers, you know, that sort of stuff. Because they had killed the cows, and they had to, you know, they had to kill the cows, and they had to cut the cows up. They had, there were certain things had to be done with certain entrails had to go over here, and the and the part, this part of the cow had to go over there, and that part of the cow had to go over there, and. You know, that was for that, that was for them, and this was for the sacrifice, and that had to be taken out and burned and all that sort of stuff, and there's blood everywhere, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a lot of work. All right. There we go. For chapter 9, here we go, chapter 9. So chapter 9 deals with the second Passover celebrate, celebrated by Israel and with the problem concerning those unqualified through uncleanness to partake of it in uh, Numbers 1 through 8. It also outlines the rules for an exceptional Passover for those not able to partake of it at a regular time, 9 through 14, and describes of the function of the cloud by day and the fiery pillar by night, which symbolize the presence of God and his guidance of Israel during the journeys, uh, Numbers 9, 15 through 23. By the way, when I was a kid, I always kind of thought, during the 40 years of, of wilderness wanderings, you know, I just thought they were kind of on the move all the time. You know, I just thought they were just constantly, just, woo, they were just constantly moving. And remember, uh, it says they, uh, you know, they might stop for a year, you know. Uh, it did, you know. Oh yeah, I mean it was. I mean, it was a process, right? That, right. That was probably one. There was that. That there may have been that five years of, of apprenticeship program because there's they, there a lot of stuff. Just think about you know that now. And these people were, and I'm sure out over the 40 years, it got a little bit easier. But and we'll get to the cloud in a minute. But if you think about this, think about. If you, if you came out of your tent every morning, by the way, which way was your tent facing? Toward the tabernacle. Okay. So if I'm over here, if I'm over here with uh, the, 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 uh, with one of the tribes and I'm, I'm, I'm here, my, the, the tabernacle's in the middle. And if you're over there with that tribe, you're, you're, you're fa so every morning I come out, and the, what's the, one of the first things that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at? I'm going to look at it where the cloud's at, right? Is, is the cloud on top of the tabernacle? Are we moving today? Right? Because if the cloud's up, what are we doing? We're moving. 
Mom, pack the kids, we're moving. All right? Because not only does, does, do we got to move, the tabernacle's got to move, I got to move too, right? Okay? All right, we'll get to that. What was the purpose of the Passover meal? Remember what happened in Egypt. Very good. Yeah. Uh, you had to go back to Exodus 12 for this. And, and you shall keep this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter in the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised you, you shall keep this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? And you shall say, it's a Passover sacrifice to the Lord because he passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our homes and the people bowed low and worship. All right? What's the purpose of the Lord's Supper? Remember. Remember what? Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Why do we do that? No, no. Let me rephrase that. Why does God want us to remember? Because we are, thank you, that is a great answer. Because we are pitifully bad at remembering things. We are horrible. Because right now there's a whole generation of people that don't know about 9-11. Uh, Dell Gentleman and I were talking about this the other day. We can say 9-11, I can say certain things about 9-11, and you, the majority of people in this room, will know exactly what I'm, I'm thinking. George Bush at the schoolhouse. Right? <laughs> Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Right? Everybody remembers that. Sweetheart, right there. I'm sorry, you don't, I know, I know. Tell me your name. Uh, Brianne. Brianne. Did, did you know what Shanksville, Pennsylvania meant? George Bush at the schoolhouse? All right, thank you, dear. Uh, and I didn't do that to embarrass you. I did that to prove a point because I didn't expect you to. It's because, because we don't remember. Because we don't remember. We need to, we, they need to remember the Passover. We need to remember the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. Right? Yes, sir. And young people don't remember because they were never taught. Yeah, and that's not and and, and that's not anything to do with you guys. You know, y'all. Now I'm not I'm not trying to embarrass you. You guys, just, just, like, I didn't teach my kids about 9/11. They just kind of just figured, you know, they they, you know, some of the stuff we teach and, and some of the stuff we teach them and then they like forget. So that's a different right. It's a different experience. All right. Poor Brianna's never going to come in my class again. So I'm so, <laughs> bless your heart. <laughs> I feel so horrible now. Uh, okay. When some men were unclaimed because they touched a dead body, what was done for them to observe the Passover? When they were unclean because they touched a dead body, what was done for them to observe the Passover? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They, they had a different time, so they observed it on the 14th day of the month. They ate it with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs that left none of it till the morning, and not a bone of it was broken, okay? All right, so they were still required to take the Passover, right? Okay. Um, why, why could they, if they were unclean during the time that the Passover was ready, uh, why was it important? Why couldn't they take it? They touched the dead body. That made them unclean. Why, why did God make... Uh, the question really I'm asking is, why did God make... Uh, why wouldn't he let unclean people take the, the Passover?
What's that? Because they're okay. Okay. Because they were unclean. Uh, and unclean meant they couldn't come into the presence of God. Okay? They couldn't come into the presence of God. All right? Uh, they still had to take the path. They still had to, I say take the Passover. They still had to observe the Passover because it was more than just taking it. It was observing it. Uh, they still had to observe the Passover. But yeah. Right. On the 14th day of the month. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Uh, the second month on the 14th day at twilight. Yeah. They should observe it. Right. Right. What was the purpose of that? Right, uh, exactly, so dual purpose. So what, one was a health kind of thing, and then the second one was so that they got this concept was in the presence of God, we are to be clean, we are to be holy, and outside of here, this is the unclean, unholy stuff, okay? All right. What is the theological significance of the bones of the Passover lamb not being broken? First of all, what kind of lamb did they, they have to have for the, the Passover lamb? Perfect. No blemish, no spot, right? Can be given, you know, and, and, and we talk about, we talk about, uh, you know, no, no broken legs or any kind of that kind of stuff. I, I, I really get the concept that it goes further than that, the, the, that they had lambs and I don't know about you, but if I had to have a perfect lamb for God, I'd find me a perfect little lamb to start off with, and I'd kind of put them all uh, over there by themselves, you know, so they couldn't bump into other lambs. Why would I do that? Yeah, yeah, we can keep them from getting spots or blemishes on them, you know. I, I want this lamb to stay perfect, right? I'd isolate them from the other ones or, or keep the all the good lambs over here so they don't bump into one another because animals tend to be stupid. Sheep are, yeah, yeah. Sheep tend to be stupid. And all the elders said amen, but anyway. <laughs> okay, Brother Floyd, don't laugh too hard there. Okay, so, all right. Uh, John, John 19, 36, where these things took place that the scripture would be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. All right. Remember when Jesus, when they get to the, uh, the, the soldier gets to Jesus and he's already dead. He was going to break the bones. He was already dead. Not a bone of him would be broken. All right. What does that mean about the, the soldier that pierced the spear in the side? What's that? Yeah, he didn't hit a rib. I can tell you that. He didn't hit a rib. He didn't break the rib. Okay. Not a bone of them be broken, okay? Pure, holy, clean. All right. May the alien living within Israel also take the Passover. Could the alien take the Passover? Yeah. Yeah. If a stranger resides among you, verse 14, and celebrates the Passover of the Lord according to the statue of the Passover and its ordinance, so he shall celebrate it. You shall have the same statue both for the stranger and for the native of the land. Okay. Uh, what did the cloud do once the tabernacle was constructed? What's that? Stayed over top of it. Okay. Uh, verse 15. Now in the day the tabernacle was erected, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony in the evening, and it was like the appearance of fire over the tabernacle until morning. That is how it was continuously. The cloud would cover it by day and the appearance of fire by night. I have, a, I have the idea that, that wherever you are at, if you stepped wherever, you, if you were from the tribe of Dan and you stepped out 
and and you, you could see that that fire over the 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 tabernacle all right because that was the centerpiece of the encampment all right it was the centerpiece of the encampment it's the uh, it's where all of uh, all of everything took place it was the the spiritual center the physical center the everything center all right how many times is the phrase command of the Lord or something similar found in this chapter or chapters? I don't know. I didn't count. <laughs> Paul's real good at telling you 24 times. Or it was a bunch. At least eight. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. There's a bunch. So what's the point? What's that? It's important. Yeah, if we haven't driven that home enough tonight, <laughs> it's important to do what God says, right? It's important to, to do it the way God says to do it. All right. Any, any questions or anything else before we end tonight's session? All right. There was a... Uh, there's a little, little town in Texas called Stockdale, Texas. Real small town. And there was a fire. There was a fire in one of the main buildings downtown. And, and uh, it was a pretty bad fire. And it was, it was uh, starting to engulf this one particular thing. And, and uh, folks were standing around the fire and whatnot. And, and uh, all of a sudden we heard the, the Tuttles come, Ma, Ma and Pa Tuttle. And, and there was uh, Millie Joe, Bobby Joe, Timmy Timmy, and Fred Tuttle. And they were on this little big old truck, and they come rumbling forward. And you could just hear them do, 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 coming toward this fire. And all of a sudden, they smash into the middle of this fire, and they start jumping out and pull, stomping and putting out fire. <laughs> they all putting it out, and they said, oh, my goodness. And, and, and sure enough, the fire went out. And they said, y'all have done save this town. And they took a, took a collection up from everybody. And they said, they give them to them. And they give them the money to Pa Tuttle. And they said, Pa Tuttle, thank you so much for saving our town. We, we just thank you so much. He said, what are you going to do with that money? And he said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is get brakes on that truck. So anyway. Next week. Next week, I'm Pa Tuttle driving the truck. Next week, <laughs> I figure if I tell y'all a joke, then y'all forget. Mess <laughs> up. Yeah, y'all won't remember all my mistakes, and we'll so anyway. All right, let's all let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful once again for your blessings, for your love, and for your word. Father, we ask that as we continue to strive to follow you, uh, that you lead us, guide us, help us to do all the things that you want us to do. Father, help us to arrive home safely. We thank you for uh, your love. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for our fellow Christians. Father, we thank you once again. And we praise your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What's that? Oh, the...